Ancient Ireland, Interactions in the Late Roman Era. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. As you have already heard, my name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. I am a founding member of the Classical Association in Northern Ireland and a committee member of the Classical Association of Ireland. My primary degree was in archaeology and ancient history. My master's and my PhD were in the study of Roman contacts across the imperial frontiers focusing on trade and the ancient economy. I have an interest in Rome beyond the western frontier, that is trade with the island they called Hibernia. I published a paper on this subject in the journal Classics Ireland, and also an article in History Ireland. For current historians, the study of Irish history begins in 431 AD, and does not include writings from the Greek and Roman past. The Cambridge History of Ireland begins in AD 600, which is 50 years after the founding of Bangor Monastery, where I come from, 50 years after the founding of Clonmacnoise, and 170 years after the Bishop Patricius undertook his Christian mission to Ireland. The first phase of Irish history is therefore dominated by early medievalists. I want to demonstrate why this is a serious omission in this talk I will give the perspective of an ancient historian familiar with both the classical texts and the material remains. Last week I gave a lecture in Athlone. I provided evidence for ancient Ireland in the Roman era. Tonight I will consider how Ireland interacted with the Roman Empire in late antiquity. So, why is ancient Ireland interesting? This map shows the Roman frontiers. The Romans invaded and occupied almost all the Celtic territories in Western Europe. They conquered most of the Atlantic seaboard of Europe and extended their empire on every frontier until they reached vast desolate regions where they met determined native resistance. To the south, Roman expansion was halted by the vast Saharan desert which stretches almost 3,000 miles across the entire expanse of North Africa. The empire faced further desert frontiers in the Near East, between Arabia, Syria and Iraq. In contrast, the European frontiers followed river systems that provided major conduits for travel and military supply. The Danube flows over a thousand miles east to empty into the Black Sea, and the Rhine flows 700 miles west to discharge into the North Sea facing Britain. In the far north, the Scottish Highlands were probably too remote and inhospitable to be successfully occupied long term. Consequently, modern maps depict a short border in Roman Britain, either along the 40-mile Antonine Wall or Hadrian's Wall, which is 80 miles long. This ignores Ireland, and a more accurate depiction of the Roman Empire would depict a major maritime frontier between Britain and Ireland. This frontier stretched 320 miles from Cornwall to Girvan, facing the Celtic and the Irish Sea. Ireland is visible from parts of North Wales and Western Scotland, where the journey is less than a day's sail in favourable weather. Across this narrow sea, the east coast of Ireland is 300 miles from Antrim to Wexford, while the southern seaboard extends 200 miles from Wexford to Cork. Some Romans thought of Britain and Ireland as a connected geographical feature, but this depended on context. In his work on astronomy, the Almagest, Claudius Ptolemy calls Ireland Micra Britannia, Small Britain. In his study of geography, he introduces Ireland as the Britannic Isle, Ivernia. Celts were a seafaring people, and early Greek and Roman accounts indicate the skill of maritime traffic along the Atlantic coast. According to Julius Caesar, the Celtic nations in northern Gaul were able to gather 220 large transport vessels to oppose a Roman conquest. These ships were active in the Channel and the sea lanes around Britain, but there were also long-distance trade routes extending from the Mediterranean up the coasts of Iberia and Gaul to reach Britain and Ireland. When Caesar launched his second expedition into southern Britain 
in 54 BC, he was joined by up to 70 Roman merchant ships seeking new opportunities for profit. Even in this era, the Romans knew the extent of the Irish Sea, and Caesar could correctly locate the Isle of Man, midpoint between Britain and Ireland. Why didn't the Romans conquer Ireland? Dismiss modern assertions that Ireland was isolated, remote or scarcely populated. The ancient Irish were not impoverished, militarily weak or culturally backward. Ireland was not the Roman land of winter, as some modern academics suggest. The evidence states that ancient Ireland was well populated and well connected to overseas territories that were subject to the Roman Empire. There was probably a cost calculation involved in the Roman decision not to conquer Ireland. A commercial revenue model for the Roman economy argues that the main income received by the imperial government came from newly mined bullion and from imposing high import taxes on trade goods crossing the Roman frontiers. Frontier taxes were set at a high one-quarter value, while goods moving between provincial boundaries were subject to a low one-fortieth tax. The Greek geographer Strabo explained the cost implications. He argued that the Romans gained greater revenues from taxing trade with an unconquered Britain than could be achieved by annexing the island. Conquest involved high risks and substantial military costs to obtain resources that were already being attracted to Roman markets through the profit-driven mechanisms of trade. Strabo suggests that the garrison costs of occupying Ireland would be unfavourable in this equation of conquest cost versus trade revenues. The Romans conquered new territories for other reasons, such as glory, military reputation, or revenge against aggressors. Strategic thinking and defence was also important, such as when the emperor Septimius Severus seized and garrisoned northern Iraq. Diocasius claims that the new territory was a bulwark, defensive barrier for the protection of Syria, but the region was costly to garrison and a cause for further conflicts with neighbouring powers. Few of the surviving ancient texts provide reasons for Roman expansion during the imperial era, and one of the most detailed concerns Ireland. Tacitus thought that Ireland should have been conquered to pacify Roman Britain and remove the example of a free territory a short sea journey away. He also thought it would better connect some of the strongest parts of the empire, including Gaul, Spain and Britain. The former Roman governor, Agricola, estimated that a complete legion of 5,000 soldiers would have been required, supported by a relatively small force of auxiliaries, probably several hundred cavalry, archers and marines. Agricola would probably have conquered Ireland in 80 AD, except there was a highland uprising in Caledonia that threatened the new Fourth Clyde frontier. As other threats emerged on continental frontiers, the Emperor Domitian reduced the Roman garrison in Britain from four to three legions. Subsequent governors did not have the forces at their disposal to conquer Ireland. The Irish Sea therefore became a major maritime frontier of the Roman Empire, and Britain remained a region subject to repeated upheavals and political unrest. The Roman cities of Deva, Chester and Glevum, Gloucestershire, faced the Irish Sea. So did the west flank of Hadrian's Wall and the military centre at Lugo Valium, Carlisle. In fair weather, it was a sailing of two or three days from Ireland to these consumer centres with their strong connections to the continent. What was Ireland like in the Roman era? In the 2nd century AD, Claudius Ptolemy created a map of the known world that included an outline depiction of Ireland. Ptolemy's information on Ireland and Caledonia dates to the same period and was probably acquired from military reports gathered in about 80 AD. The 16 Irish tribes recorded on this map, suggest that Ireland had a population of about 180,000 adults, so more than double the population of modern Galway. Tacitus suggests 
that the eight tribes who occupied relatively marginal lands in Highland Caledonia were able to assemble over 30,000 fighters to oppose the Romans. Based on this information, the ancient Irish could probably raise a fighting force of over 65,000 men if the chiefs of their regional kingdoms acted in unison. Ptolemy records the existence of two settlements on the east coast of Ireland that might have traded with Roman Britain. These are Manapaya near Wicklow, and Ablana, which is Drumana Promontory Fort, just north of modern Dublin. These sites were under the control of powerful regional chiefs, engaged in wide-ranging trade and exchange. There was probably a Roman presence in these Irish settlements, with British and Gallic subjects of the Empire residing long-term in these centres. There they would make deals and stockpile commodities for their colleagues who visited during the summer trading season. This explains the presence of low-value Roman money at Dromana. Resident Roman merchants might have been using the coins to buy low-value items, supplies and services from foreign visitors. The earliest Roman finds at Dromana date to about 80 AD, when Agricola considered conquering Ireland. The finds include fragments of pottery storage jars, fine tableware, dress fasteners, belt buckles, and copper ingots that might have been mined locally. These ingots conformed to imperial weight standards, and were probably mined and processed for export to Roman markets in Britain and Gaul. Other exports would have included cow hides, leather, butter, livestock, and slaves. Several Roman graves were found at Bray Head, on the coast between Eblana and Manapea, Dublin and Wicklow. Each grave was outlined by flagstones, and a copper coin was placed on the chest of the deceased, according to proper Roman burial customs. The coins were required in the afterlife to pay transit costs to reach the other world. The graves date to the early 2nd century AD, and the coins are issues by the emperors Trajan and Hadrian. These could be Roman settlers from a nearby community who established their own gravesite. Or perhaps a Roman ship had suffered some misfortune at sea, and the crew buried their companions at the nearest safe landing site. Roman subjects also visited sacred centres in Ireland, and Ptolemy refers to certain travellers from the Empire who had measured the longest day at inland Irish sites. Roman objects have been found in Irish contexts. Gold Roman coins with decorative loops and glassware jewellery have been excavated at the sacred mound of Newgrange. These gold coins have obvious symbolism associated with the sun. The discovery of a radiant gold decorated brooch with a green glass globe in its centre, also has a symbolic link to the grassy mound. Perhaps these dedications were made by Irish people who had acquired valuable items from Roman traders. Conversely, in the Roman town of Bath, archaeologists found an Irish brooch among dedications in a sacred pool of the Celtic Roman deity Sulis Minerva. Perhaps an Irish person had visited this place and offered a personal item to the goddess. During the 3rd century AD, the Roman Empire entered an era of military crisis caused by repeated civil wars and foreign invasions. Pollen evidence from Irish bogs and lake sediments suggests that there was environmental change from about 200 AD onwards. Woodlands were cut back and the Irish began growing a greater quantity of grain crops there was a corresponding increase in the Irish population. The Historia Augusta reports a prophecy presented to the Emperor Tacitus, who came to power in 275 AD. The author imagined how the empire could secure a permanent peaceful future under a unified government. One of these measures involved placing a conquered Ireland under the governorship of a Roman proconsul. Proconsuls, were senators in provinces that did not require legionary garrisons. This might have been suggested, as a peaceful Ireland would reduce troop requirements in Britain. 
When do events in Ireland form a historical narrative? Ireland re-emerges as a historical subject during the 4th century AD, when Roman Britain was at the height of its prosperity. This is also the era when Ireland becomes a threat to the Empire. 4th century Britain had about seven major towns and small cities, connected by ports and paved road networks. The population probably included more than two million people, with a minority living in the cities and most communities engaged in agriculture. In contrast, the Roman garrison might have consisted of less than 20,000 soldiers. A record of Roman units and offices, known as Notitia Dignitatum, lists 14 garrison sites along Hadrian's Wall, including some decommissioned outposts. A possible force of 10,000 soldiers or half the provincial army, could have defended this 80-mile-long land frontier. Legions were based in prominent urban centres, including Ecboricum, York, in the north, Diva, Chester, in the west, and Richborough, in southeast Britain. However, by the 4th century, the legions had been divided and reduced into units incorporating only about a thousand armoured infantry. A further nine garrison posts, known as the Saxon shore forts, guarded the southeast side of Britain, facing the Rhine frontier and the coastal territories of Free Germany. This network controlled passage through the English Channel, which narrowed to only 20 miles between Britain and Gaul. The Channel defences prevented seaborne Germanic warbands entering the Celtic Sea to raid prosperous sites in southern Britain and the Gallic coast. Under this protection, hundreds of Roman merchant ships crisscrossed the sea lanes to facilitate trade between Britain and the continent. In contrast, the west coast frontier of Britain was poorly defended. For unknown reasons, the Roman sources of this era began referring to the Irish by a new name, the Scotti. This term could describe all Irish people, or perhaps more specifically, Irish populations who began settling in Western Britain. The name could be related to the early Irish word scut, meaning severed or cut off. Perhaps it originally signified exiles from the homeland. The exiling may have been voluntary, with Irish settlers, adventurers and warriors renouncing clan affiliations to form new political groupings. Early Irish traditions identify this era as the time of the Fianna. These were roving warbands of Irish youths who offered their military services to powerful chiefs. Modern genetic studies will reveal the extent of these Irish migrations into Western Britain. Over the course of several generations, the Scotti became the dominant political power in Caledonia, and their Gaelic language replaced native Pictish. The first Scotti established a presence on the west coast of Caledonia, taking control of the islands facing Ireland. Perhaps they had always been there in small numbers. This could have been where Agricola encountered an exile Irish chief when Roman forces were scouting the Firth of Clyde. Ptolemy lists the Western Isles as Irish territory and asserts their position north of Ireland. They appear in early Irish traditions as the site of warrior training camps and it was said that Cúhollán received battle training on Scatha, thought to be the Isle of Skye. It was here that the Scotti from Antrim formed the sea-linked kingdom of Dalriada. There is evidence that by the 4th century, this frontier was becoming a concern for the Empire. A Latin text from 312 AD outlines the Roman provinces and adds the ominous note. Barbarian tribes who have increased under the emperors, Scotti, Picts and Caledonians. About the same time, a Roman author who was rewriting the Jewish War by Josephus decided to mention Britain. He emphasises the power and reach of contemporary Rome, with the updated comment claiming that Ireland, Scotia, which owes loyalty to no one, 
fears the Romans. Roman descriptions from this era record another Irish people called the Atticotai, who are mentioned alongside the Scotti. Both names appear in the same period, in the same geographical context, and they have no obvious connection to earlier population groups documented in Roman accounts. The Atticotai were probably a subgroup of Irish people, since the term is interchangeable with Scotti in certain manuscripts. It has been suggested that the Roman term Atticotai is a Latinized form of the Gaelic, Athectuatha, meaning vassal clan. These subject or tribute paying clans are well attested in early Irish traditions. These Irish intruders brought their wolfhounds into Britain, a breed larger and far more formidable than any domesticated dog in Roman territories. Consequently, the Roman sources preserve an association between the Irish and these giant hounds. The connection between the Irish and the war hounds was probably strengthened by the distinctive Celtic dialect spoken in Ireland. The ancient Britons spoke a soft-sounding dialect known as Brythonic, but the Irish pronounced a harsh-sounding variant that survives as modern Gaelic. It was therefore possible for the Romans to distinguish between British and Irish populations. The Roman land frontier in northern Britain was well garrisoned. By contrast, the western flank of Britain from the Cornish Peninsula to Cumbria was relatively poorly defended. This was possibly because the Irish kingdoms were restrained by long-term peace agreements arranged by the Roman government. Ammianus Marcellinus refers to these terms as the arranged peace. And these political associations probably had a long history. The appearance of an Irish chief in the entourage of Agricola suggests that early diplomatic channels existed and were effective. The Roman garrison network in Britain could not quickly mobilise to counter hostilities from across the Irish Sea. Chester was a significant city of perhaps 15,000 people. It was probably the fourth largest city in Britain but its garrison only included a thousand soldiers. Sigontium, the main Roman stronghold in North Wales, had a cohort garrison of perhaps 500 soldiers. These west coast garrisons could be reinforced from other frontier stations, but it was 200 miles, or 10 days of hard marching, from Hadrian's Wall south via Ecboricum to Chester. Furthermore, if the countryside was overrun, and lines of communication severed, then isolated garrisons could not easily form a sufficiently large force to find and then repel the attackers. How did the Irish cross the sea? The sailing from Ireland to the west coast of Britain was made in small wooden-hulled boats or leather-skinned wicker-framed curras. The appearance of these ships is suggested by a tiny model boat found in a votive collection of gold objects known as the Brugter Horde. This horde, which dates to the 1st century BC, was discovered near Limavadi on the shores of Loch Foyle. Its gold ornaments, including a highly decorated torque, are a state treasure currently displayed in Dublin at the National Museum of Ireland. The Brugter model ship depicts a 14-oared Irish vessel, complete with mast yard, steering oar, boat hook and grappling iron. If it is an accurate representation, then these vessels might have been close to 30 foot long. The remains of a small 4th century Irish boat in Loch Lean, County Westmeath, confirms that Irish craftsmen were familiar with the mortise and tenon technique for fastening hull planking. This was a construction practice used in the large Roman and Gallic trade vessels that operated along the Atlantic coasts. The Loch Lean boat was built from robust oak planks secured with dowels made from Irish yew, a pliable, easily shaped hardwood that does not shrink or rot in damp conditions. This is a local scuba diving club who found and recovered the hull, and that's their dog. The advantage of hide-skin boats is that the crew did not need harbours or shallow beaching sites. They could sail their vessels upriver or carry them ashore for safe storage or easy concealment. 
rowing crews brought their long, sleek curras ashore hull upwards, carried shoulder high over their heads. Irish flotillas could be seen after the winter storms, and the sight of these black hide coverings caused fear among the Roman British. The churchman Gildas describes the intruders, like dark swarms of insects that emerge from the narrow crevices of their holes when the sun is high and the weather grows warm. How did the Irish threaten Britain? The first major conflict between Ireland and the Roman Empire occurred in 360 AD. Irish chiefs violated their peace treaties and joined with the Picts to launch attacks on the northern frontiers. Irish cooperation allowed seaborne Pictish warbands to circumvent Hadrian's Wall, using the Irish seaboard to launch attacks on Cumbria. Ammianus describes how savage tribes of Irish and Picts broke the arranged peace and devastated the frontier regions. The newly proclaimed Emperor Julian was in Gaul, campaigning against a Germanic people called the Alamanni, who had overrun the Rhineland frontiers. He sent a general named Lupicanus to Britain, who crossed in midwinter with four units from the mobile field army to reinforce the province. This force, of just over 4,000 soldiers, was enough to restore order. But Ammianus reports that Julian instructed the general to settle matters in Britain, either by force or by negotiation. The Irish and Picts launched further attacks against Roman Britain in 364 AD. At the same time, renewed Saxon attacks on the southeast coast of Britain meant that many Roman forces were confined to the garrison stations and were unable to assemble into a decisive campaign force. These attacks, which may have been seasonal raids, reached the interior of Britain, and Ammianus reports that Irish warbands were roaming far and wide and ravaging much of the country. In 368 AD, another Roman expedition force was sent to Britain to restore order, and Pacatus reports that the Irish were driven back to their marshlands. Claudian suggests that there was serious fighting, as the Irish wept at the mounds of dead Scotti. How did the Romans restore order? Since the Romans could not defeat the Irish with a direct attack on their homeland, negotiation was attempted. In this era, the depleted Roman army accepted foreign fighters into military service to decrease enemy numbers and bolster imperial forces fighting on other frontiers. The Romans probably brought the Irish back under treaty with bullion payments to their leaders and war chiefs. In return, thousands of Atticotai were recruited into the Roman military to fight on other frontiers. Some of the Irish recruits were taken to Trier in Gaul, which was a major military and administrative centre close to the heavily guarded Rhine frontier. Jerome saw some of these soldiers in 368 AD when he was living in Trier. He writes, Why should I speak of other nations when I myself, as a young man in Gaul, saw the Scotti, Atticotti? The Notitia Dignitatum suggests the existence of at least six units of Atticotti, Irish serving in the Rhine and Danube provinces. Each unit would have included several hundred men, trained, armed and equipped according to Roman military practices. This is a picture of shields from the manuscript. Three units of Atticotti were serving in the Western Empire and three were serving in the East. Each unit would have included up to 600 men who would have been reinforced by local recruits as their numbers declined. The title of the Western units may indicate service under the Emperor Honorius. There is a missing seventh unit, the Irishmen of the senior Atticotti in Gaul. They may all have perished in battle, fighting in one of the many conflicts that occurred on the German frontier. This is a silver plate displayed in the Museum of Art and History in Geneva. It depicts a guard of Roman soldiers 
led either by Christ or by an emperor. The guardsman on the far right has a shield pattern similar in design to the Atacotai. The emblem is shared by a unit of auxilia called the Defensores, the Defenders. This unit is listed under the command of the first master of the soldiers in the imperial presence. You can see the heads of hounds on the shield. The Atacotai appear in military inscriptions from the continent. A marble gravestone from northern Greece bears the Greek inscription, Memorial to Leon, a soldier of the Atacotai unit. Another fragmentary Latin inscription was found on a sarcophagus at Salona in Croatia. It is the grave of a Roman officer who managed troop pay, Noctuares. It reads, Unit Atticotai, lived under arms, buried on the day. This paymaster died far from his Irish homeland. By this era, the Roman army was a Christian institution, and the return of ex-soldiers was one means by which the religion might have entered Irish society. In 377 AD, a churchman named Epiphanes published an encyclopedia of heretical beliefs called the Panarion. It is interesting that when considering the inhabitants of the far north, he mentions the Franks and includes the Scotti, the Irish. In 381 AD, a church leader named Pelagius arrived in Rome and began to gain support for an alternative interpretation of the Christian faith. Jerome had already encountered Irishmen in Gaul and identified Pelagius as belonging to this same nation. Jerome describes Pelagius as being like a mountain dog, large and bulky, who is able to lash out more with his heels than with his teeth. His lineage is off the Irish people near the Britons. Jerome also describes Pelagius as being weighed down with Irish porridge. Porridge was a staple food made from oats, but the Romans considered this crop better suited to feeding livestock. Pelagianism may have been an early Irish adaptation of Christianity, developed in a society that had no single state authority or written criminal laws. A Christian presence among the Irish is suggested in the 390s AD by Prudentius, who asserts that no person could deny that a supreme order rules, even amongst the half-wild Irish, who are worse than a warhound. But the Irish were still under treaty in 393 AD. In this year, a leading Roman statesman named Symmachus was able to display seven Irish wolfhounds to the astonished population in Rome. Symmachus refers to the event in a letter, suggesting that these animals appeared so large and fierce that spectators thought they had been brought in cages like predatory wild animals. He reports that, On the prelude day, the presentation of Irish dogs so astonished Rome that it was assumed that they were brought in iron cages. They might have been a gift to Roman authorities from Irish warrior recruits. This picture is a military parade in New York City. Although they were trained to attack wolves, Irish wolfhounds are known for their gentle disposition and used in ancient times to guard homesteads and herds. Britain was still peaceful in 396 AD when a Gallic bishop named Victricus visited Britain to settle a dispute between church leaders on the island. The following year, the Irish attacked. The court port, Claudian describes how the Scotti raised all Ireland, and the sea foamed with hostile oars as Britain succumbed to the neighbouring tribes. A 5th century inscription from Rochester displays a Latinized Irish text in Roman capitals. It was pecked rather than chiselled cut into the stone. The text reads in ancient Irish, Hound King, Son, Mac, of the Sacred Clan. Rochester is about 50 miles inland from Chester. This confirms the possible range, strength and focus of early Irish incursions. During these incursions, 
Irish war bands would bypass the understrength Roman garrisons barricaded in their walled towns and advance en masse towards the inland country estates where they could pillage the largely undefended villas of the British elite. The leading Roman commander, Stilacco, sent a campaign force to Britain to rally the garrisons and repel the Irish assault. After this conflict, the Roman units in Britain were permanently reinforced by a small field army consisting of several thousand soldiers, including a legion. By 400 AD, the conflict was concluded, and Claudian claims that due to this intervention, Britain no longer fears the spears of the Irish. However, the Britons seized during these raids remained in Ireland as long-term captives, with little prospect of returning to their former lives and positions within Roman society. The Romans introduced countermeasures to limit further seaborne attacks on Britain. This included patrol ships sent to intercept possible raiding vessels or report back on their landing sites. Vegetius describes Roman scouting craft called pictacti, tar-daubed by the British. These were small, single-banked galleys, with 20 oars on each side, indicating 40 marines as rowing crew, and perhaps 10 on-board auxiliaries. The Gettius reports that the crew were instructed to locate, and at times intercept, the passage of enemy ships, and to discover by observation their arrival or plans. The sails and rigging were dyed sea-green for naval camouflage, and even the pitch which the ships are daubed, is stained that colour. The Roman navy maintained constant patrols along the British coasts, and Vigatius explains, The sailors and marines wear sea-green clothing as they go about their scouting. They may escape detection the more easily, not only by night, but also by day. Patrol vessels could be launched from the Roman forts at Chester, Zagontium or Vicus, but their options were limited once the Irish made landfall. In early 402 AD, the Romans removed crucial military units from Britain to help defend Italy from a Gothic invasion. Claudian confirms that when the Roman army assembled for the Battle of Palentia, it included the legion protecting distant Britain, which restrains the fierce Irish. The withdrawal of these forces meant that the Irish could now cross into Britain with less opposition and ambitious leaders probably gathered forces to plan new expeditions. Ogham's script appears in this era, with incised lines on either side of a central stem. This unique Irish system of notation was devised using the Latin alphabet. The Irish could have adopted straightforward Latin script written in monumental capital letters, but they developed their own cryptic characters that could not be easily read by outsiders. The script might have been developed by Irishmen, who had learnt Latin in the Roman army. Most of the surviving examples are carved into large standing stones, and since they display names and tribes, they could be ancient memorials or territorial markers. One of the earliest Ogham stones was discovered during excavations at the Roman town of Silchester, south of modern Oxford. The damaged Ogham script was carved vertically into a small Roman pillar. It reads, of Epicatus, son of the tribe of. Silchester was partly derelict in this period, and the pillar might have been erected by Irish recruits billeted in some abandoned residences prior to training or embarkation. The settlement was not far from the Isle of Wight, which was a major base for the Roman fleet that protected the channel. Early Irish traditions suggest that Ogham stones were territorial markers that issued challenges to intruders. This explains why the hero Cúhalan casts a pillar stone of a rival champion into a lake as the prelude for combat. It is interesting that the Silchester pillar was found at the bottom of a well. Maybe this is how Tebicatus and his comrades renounced his territorial marker prior to leaving the site. The name Tebicatus meant he who offers battle. Another Ogham inscription was carved on a Roman grinding stone. This volcanic stone was imported from Germany and found at a well in Oxeter in Staffordshire. 
The well was nearby a Roman garrison that probably had an Irish contingent in residence. There is evidence that Irish men serving in the Roman army returned to their tribal homelands. An early Ogham stone found at Burnsfort, County Cork, records the name of a man describing himself by the Latin term Sagittarius, archer. This was not a traditional martial skill attested in our Irish warrior culture. An Ogham inscription from Kinnard East in Kerry commemorates an individual with a Latin name, Marianus. Another inscription in Rath Glass in County Carlow as someone whose father also had the Latin name, Marianus. The inscription reads, Dondonus, Mac, son of Marianus. In this period, the local capital in Munster, which had been known as Ivernus, received the name Cashel. This could derive from the Latin Castellum. In some of the earliest Irish genealogies, the Leinster chief, Talman, is given the title Parfol Tribune, Trebum. An image in the Notitia Dignitatum reveals how bullion was paid to soldiers and allied nations. The bankrupt Roman state collected and confiscated household silverware to pay its troops. This metal was cut into weights and bagged, or melted into small bullion bars, which were stamped by local workshops. The officers responsible for these payments were under the authority of the comes logitionis. You can see the silver bowls filled with gold coins and silver tableware, plates, caskets, and bags of hacked silver. Presiding over these payments is a gold image of the emperor. This is a gold-plated silver dish in the same style. It shows an image of the Emperor Theodosius I. Foreign leaders would pledge allegiance to this image. They would take payment and deliver their warriors into imperial service. A famous hoard of Roman silver was found in a gravel pit at Belene in County Limerick. The hoard included several ingots and three pieces of hacked silver plate showing classical scenes and motifs. The hacked silver may have come from Roman dining platters, but it was cut into specific weights for making standardised payments. The ingots were stamped with the names of state-approved workshops to verify the quality of the metal. One ingot displays the Roman stamp from the workshop of the Satos. An identical stamp was used for ingots found at the Roman forts of Richborough and Reculver in southeast Britain. This was the military base of the Second Augustan Legion and the main port for passage to the continent. A further stamp from one of the Balin ingots bore the Cairo Christian symbol, indicating the influence of the new religion. This hoard is displayed in the National Museum in Dublin. Similar silver hoards have been found in Scotland and the Netherlands, where they are interpreted as payments made by the Roman state to foreign peoples. The famous Trappian Law treasure is now thought to be a Roman payment to the Votadinae nation who occupied borderlands between the Firth of Forth and Hadrian's Wall. The Romans probably offered similar payments to the Irish who controlled sea lanes on the other side of the frontier. The Colrin hoard found on the north coast of Ireland contained hack silver, ingots and Roman coins. The hack silver came from frames, dishes and part of a large bowl. Some of the pieces were tarnished or gilded with gold. One of the ingots was stamped with the inscription from the workshop of the patrician. Patrician was a title assumed by Roman noblemen and it inspired the personal name Patricius, Patrick. Another ingot is stamped, Missai. My colleague, Dr. Peter Crawford, suggests that this is a reference to the Latin missio, a discharge payment given to soldiers. The find included 1,484 Roman coins, which were stashed in a small leather sack. The coins are thin silver issues, known as siliquae, which were produced after 357 AD. Siliquae were flashy lightweight coins, probably designed for mass distribution in public spectacles 
or payment to foreign people who valued coin for metal content rather than currency value. The latest coin in the Colerian find dates to between 407 and 411, so the hoard was deposited after this date. Remnants of the Colerian hoard are in storage in the Ulster Museum in Belfast, but the finest pieces were taken to England and are in the British Museum. These items ought to be displayed in a museum on the island where they were found. In 406 AD, Germanic peoples overran the Rhine frontiers and devastated large parts of Gaul. A general named Constantine gathered the Roman soldiers in Britain and led them across the channel to restore order. But he declared himself co-emperor, provoking a brutal civil war. His armies were defeated by supporters of the Emperor Honorius in 409 AD. A year later, the provincial cities of Britain were instructed to organise their own defence using locally raised militia. That was the year the Visigoths sacked Rome. But Roman objects from this era are still being discovered. In 2014, Roman items were found at Dundrum Bay on the east coast of County Down. The finds included 5th century Roman signet rings along with part of a military belt buckle. The large June beaches of Murloc Bay were probably an embarkation site for Irish war bands heading for Britain and returning with captive wealth. In this period, the Irish sent ships and settlers to seize the Isle of Man, which lies midway between Ireland and Cumbria. Writing in 417 AD, Orosius reports that Mevania, the Isle of Man, is near to Ireland. It is not small. It has favourable soil, and the Irish now dwell there. One Ogham stone from the island records a message in Irish and Latin. The Irish Ogham states, Ambicatus, Mac Rocatus, while the accompanying Latin text reads, Ambicatus, son of Rocatus, lies here. Ambicatus could mean, he who gives battle on both sides, or he who gives battle all around. The presence of 5th century Ogham stones in northwest Wales confirms the influence that Irish communities were developing. In the far north of Britain, the Irish Scotti who settled in western Caledonia would ultimately subdue the rival Picts and give their name to the entire country. Archaeological remains, such as the Roman objects found at Dundrum, Dramana, Colrian and Belin, demand explanation. Furthermore, genetic evidence retrieved from ancient remains and modern populations will soon reveal important new information about the movements of peoples in the distant past. All this requires a response from ancient historians, and that is our task. These new research areas will push back the boundaries of our subject and reveal the genuine character of ancient Ireland in the late Roman period. Thank you for your attention.